Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. Um, for those who are new to me, my name is Alex and I am a writer and content creator. And today I'm really excited to be starting a new playlist here on YouTube where I read and discuss some of my most popular Substack essays from the past two years. Substack is a platform that I absolutely love and I'm so excited to be a part of it. I have an amazing community of around 5,000 readers there and I have published around 100 essays over the past two years and I thought it would be really fun to introduce some of those essays to my YouTube audience. So today what I'm going to do is on this old cell phone, which is most successful to me at this moment, I'm going to read to you my most popular Substack essay and then maybe pause in moments to tell you a little bit more context or just afterwards share some thoughts and maybe reactions, feelings about what this essay means to me now. I haven't read this since I published it on December 4th, 2023, so it's um, going to be interesting to revisit it. Um, so yeah, let's go. I'm actually not even going to pause. I'm just going to jump right in. And if you hear some sounds in the background, that is because I am in Spain and they are doing a lot of construction on my apartment. And um, I've decided to just embrace it instead of waiting to make content and make videos until I leave Spain. I'm just going to embrace that this is life. There are sounds and that is wonderful. So let's go. So the essay is called... There is room on the mountaintop for all of us, and if you would like to read along with me, I'm going to include a link to the essay in the show notes below, or you can just listen to me read it. Um, there's also a AI recording of it on the Substack website, but if you prefer to hear a human voice, there you go. There is room on the mountaintop for all of us. Creative anxiety, artistic comparison, bids of connection, persistence, resilience, and the climb ahead. When I was young, and still in college, I used to walk obsessively. As a person who tended towards anxiety from a young age, walking helped me to understand what I was thinking, separate what mattered most, and decide what I could let go of for good. In college, I took a poetry seminar with an older professor named Cynthia. She had just won a big fancy award that meant she was officially a genius, and she told us that when she heard the news, she was in her garden planting the seeds of something new. Someone called to her from the porch, her brother, I think it was, and he yelled, Cynthia, it's the award people. Tell them I'll call back later, she'd said, and went on gardening. She told us this story with a giggle, with the self-satisfaction of someone who became everything they dreamed of becoming. I yearned to care so little about what others thought of me, being so present and in love with my own day-to-day -day life that I didn't go running the moment a phone call like that came for me. In college, I wasn't that talented, and I knew it. I was passionate, but there's a difference. Years later, at the Iowa Writers' Workshop, my professor Amber confessed, the most talented students never really make it. It's always the students who, for whatever reason, just simply refuse to stop writing. I liked the idea that I might be remembered for this, my stick to -itiveness. Who needed natural talent or innate brilliance if you showed up every day and poured your heart out? That had to count for something, right? There were others in the class with Cynthia who were far more talented than me, who had come from illustrious families, some of literary renown. I didn't understand the complexities of intersectional privilege yet. I was middle class and my peers were not. I didn't know that I was spending my summers watching Full House with my sister while they were spending their summers at creative writing intensives in Italy. We were only 20 years old, still babies, and there were some that were already published in the big journals, already making a name for themselves in the industry. I tried not to think about it, but sometimes it haunted me. I felt like I was starting a race in last place on zero sleep and with nothing but my Schopenhauerian will to guide me. These other writers had money and connections and famous family members. What did I have? Persistence? Follow through? Passion? That was it. Still, I felt it had to count for something, that if I just kept plugging away at my craft one day, I would arrive somewhere beautiful. So I kept writing. I worked my way up in the Stonefence Review, our school's literary magazine, until I was the editor-in-chief. When I took over, I strived to create a space where everyone, even the untalented like myself, mattered. 
I was still wounded from a freshman year rejection of a grief poem processing the loss of my grandmother's passing that a now famous journalist, who at the time was the magazine's chief editor, had laughed at and mocked publicly during our blind submission readings. I wanted to be different than her, to strive to see the beauty in every submission, to publish as many things as we could, to be the opposite of a gatekeeper. In Sanborn's basement, my ragtag group of writers would meet and read submissions, eat pastries, read poems and passages from our heroes, and encourage one another. In free writing sessions, I would invite everyone to share and try to find something that I loved about each piece to vocalize publicly, no matter how clumsy the writing was. I remember what it felt like to be young and clumsy, and I wanted our members, especially the new ones, to feel that if they kept going, that someday they too could make it whatever that meant for them. Cynthia was one of the only professors who I felt never judged me. I took her classes again and again. She only wanted me to win. I needed that. Life had beat me down in those days. Loved ones lost to cancer, illness, car accidents. With each rip of my spirit, I sought refuge in the people who might see me as somehow still worthy and unbroken, someone who was still possible. My favorite person in the class besides Cynthia was my friend Sadia. She was a bit older than the rest of us and had already graduated, but was just auditing the course. She and the professor were old friends. I loved the idea of being friends with someone who knew you as a young writer and again as whatever you became on the other side after graduation. Sadia had just gotten back from France and shared powerful poems about anti-blackness in French society. We were in an old room that was constructed so that if you whispered on one end, the other end could hear you clear as day. I would get lost into the void of that dome-like ceiling as I listened to her words. Sidia was smart, and like my literary hero at the time, Grace Paley, activism came before writing. We marched together in Black Lives Matter protests, strategized and chatted together, and worked together on late-night study sessions for me and writing sessions for her. One night, over coffee, Sidia taught me about something called Bids of Connection. She said that whenever someone tells you something about themselves, it is as if they are offering themselves vulnerably for an embrace that might not come. That when someone offers something new, something you didn't know, their soul is extending a bid of connection with yours. How we respond to these bids of, of connection is what determines our relationships, she'd said. I became obsessed with the idea, searching for bids of connection in everyday conversations with my parents, with friends, with professors, and trying my best to always validate them before extending bids of my own. It was a beautiful time, and I watched as my friendships began to feel deeper and somehow more connected than before. Some days after class, if it was still light out, Sadia and I would walk down to Occam Pond and walk laps, not for any particular reason other than it was beautiful and we liked walking together. There was a forest path that diverted away from the pond and one big wild loop that took you away from the town for an hour or so into the forested house of gargantuan trees, creeping moss, little rabbits, and forest critters of all kinds. We talked for hours about everything you could think of. She was the kind of person I dreamed of becoming. She just seemed so effortless, so confident, so smart. She was herself, and she never made you feel bad if you didn't quite know who you were yet, if you were still figuring things out. One day, when walking, I asked Sadia how she handled the fact that some people our age are further along in their goals. Does it ever make you feel bad? At the time, one of my friends had just graduated, securing a big book deal, and while I was happy for her, I felt like there was something wrong with me. Hadn't we taken similar classes? Hadn't we been so similar? Maybe she had something I didn't, some innate special quality that I would never know. Maybe this was the universe telling me to throw in the towel. Maybe passion and persistence just weren't enough after all. Sadia said something to me then, something that has stuck with me ever since, something that healed me in a way I didn't know I needed to be healed. She said that her philosophy is that there's room on the mountaintop for all of us. She said that just because some people get there more quickly doesn't mean the mountain is moving or closing up shop. It's still there, waiting for us. There's no shortage of camps at the summit. There's room for all of us, and we'll all arrive when and where we are meant to be eventually. So how can you fall in love with the climb in the meantime? Lately, on Substack, I've been seeing a lot of people talk about competition, about followers and badges and algorithms. We came to this place to share art and to connect with one another. And I just want to remind you that there's room on the mountaintop for all of us. Some of us are just starting our hike. 
Some have been hiking for weeks, months, or years, and some of us are still ordering our hiking boots online, but each of us is still a hiker. Each of us matters. Each of our journey matters. No one journey is inherently better or worse than another. Our journeys to the summit are going to look so different depending on how we climb, the breaks we take, and who we bring with us, but it doesn't change the fact that there's room on the mountaintop for all of us, that the only thing we can do when we are shown someone who got there faster or who somehow scaled the mountain free solo style is salute them from the trail and keep hiking and climbing anyway. Stopping when we need to for cabot cheese, sandwiches, and water, nights full of conversation and campfires and laughter, making a little more progress each and every day towards our own summit. The summit will mean something different to each person, and I would encourage you to think long and hard about why you are making this climb in the first place. But if you find that you are overcome with self-doubt, self-comparison, and this gnawing, persistent feeling that you are somehow just not good enough, I want you to know that that isn't true. There is no scarcity of the world's creative resources. Your summit is there, it exists, and it's real. And there's a whole community of people who are cheering you on as you take each step towards your highest becoming. Don't be so focused on the destination that you forget just how beautiful that is, that you forget to stare at the brilliance of the forest path and route to the top. You might skin your knee or get stuck wading through muddy, rained out riverbeds, but your climb only stops when you do. And how you think of it is all about how you want to think of it. Maybe that year you spent not hiking at all gave you the wisdom for this next section of the path. Maybe it was so that your hiking buddy, the one you didn't know would keep you going, could forge a new way forward with you in tandem so that the two of you could make camp together each night of the climb. Don't let the people who hike faster than you convince you that you're hiking too slowly, and don't let the people who've reached their own summit once a year make you believe that your slow and steady path is anything but exactly what you needed. It's been years since those walks with Sadia. I still look back on them fondly, and I think back on how great of a hiking buddy she was and still is. Since our time together, I've been so lucky to meet many supportive and loving hiking companions, loving hiking companions, who've taught me, inspired me, walked with me, and guided me along the winding path. One day in 2021, when I was busy completing my graduate Master of Fine Arts degree, I woke up and logged on to Pose.org, where I often start the day. And whose face was looking back at me? Sadia's. Her poem had been selected as the poem of the day right there on the home page. I immediately felt overcome with profound joy. I wept. I thought of the millions who are reading her words and that someone so wise and kind and deserving was getting the star treatment. It just filled up my soul with so much unbridled joy. That same week, I received notice that a story of my own that I'd labored over for a year was being published in a magazine I loved and respected and was going to be included in a fiction anthology that was set to publish the following year. I don't know if that week was Sadia's and I summit. I'm sure there will be so many mountains that we climb in this lifetime, but it was so beautiful hiking together. What she and that experience taught me is that I would give anything to go back to those walks around Occam, those walks through the forest, beaming with wonder at another soul on the same journey. I long for those quiet days in Cynthia's class, those afternoons and evenings spent reading and studying together. I see now why Cynthia didn't immediately run to the phone, why so many who reach their summit immediately begin hiking someplace new. It is the journey that fuels us. It is the journey that truly matters. That high, that rush of achievement, of success, I promise it is so brief and fleeting. But the journey, our collective wandering, our daily climb, especially when it is with people we love, that is what will continually prove to be the most rewarding thing of all. That's the end. Also, I just took a shower before this and the water is like not all dry and it's dripping down my face. Um, do you see it dripping? Um, I should have dried myself better. But yes, I hope you enjoyed this essay. That is my most popular essay on Substack. I'm really grateful for uh, the dozens of responses and the hundreds of likes and reposts. And I got so many just wonderful pieces of feedback and emails about how that essay really resonated with people. And I just want to reaffirm that it's never too late to do what you might want to do. There's no 
rush. There's no timeline. I think that people think that you have to have published a novel by 25 to be a novelist. There are many writers who don't get their start until their 40s or 50s. And so many career paths and so many disciplines, it takes decades to really hone your skill. And no matter what time you start in life, whether you're starting in your 30s, whether you're starting in your 40s or your 50s, it is completely valid and totally probable that if you dedicate yourself daily, weekly, monthly to the pursuit of getting better at the craft, and if you make friends and network and are kind to yourself and loving to yourself and have fun along the way, you will find success. And success is also such an arbitrary and uh, differing term because for some success means the Nobel Prize and for some success means people who will listen to their words and respond with love and connection and care. And I just, I hope that you know that whatever success means for you, if you are kind enough to yourself to stay dedicated to your craft, you will find those successes. And I hope that this essay both comforts you and knowing that it's never too late to be once, what you once might have been. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, I hope that it comforts you to know that, but also to really ask yourself why you want certain successes in the first place. I think a lot of people feel that if they become famous or if they become rich, it might fill some void inside of themselves that they'll actually end up feeling the very same way once they achieve that money or just achieve that success or acclaim. And I would just always encourage to, to really interrogate what are you hoping that the success in this field will do? What do you hope that it will eliminate from your life? Do you think that if you become a famous novelist or a famous musician, that it'll somehow eliminate you from pain? Do you think it'll somehow heal your heartbreak? Um, because while art can be such a, it's like a safe, wonderful source of refuge, and while really diving into your hobby or your craft can be something that fuels you and heals you, um, there are also some things that success and external external things can't, can't fix and that you have to go within to forgive yourself, forgive others, and lovingly move forward. Um, I have so much more to say, but this is already 16 minutes, so I just want to honor your time, and I hope that you enjoyed this essay. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments, and I'll try to keep this series up of recording all of my previous essays and future essays and creating a space uh, and a new medium for us to talk about ideas that um, I'm sharing on there, and I would love to talk about whatever ideas that you would like to share as well. So I love you guys. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Love you all, and I will see you soon. Bye!